Well, it's a joy to be back with you again, share from God's word. I want to just mention that uh, I'm here because of the men's intensive Bible study that will begin this evening. And it's probably still not too late if you're a guy and you want to come and uh, just think we're going to be studying the book of Ezekiel. One day you're going to get to heaven, you're going to meet this guy called Ezekiel, and he's going to say, did you read my book? And I would hate for you to say, oh, I never quite got around to it. So there's an opportunity this this week to get a good overview of Ezekiel, and uh, it's not too late. We'd love to see you there. Also, I just want to mention at the back, I did put a few uh, pictures of our uh, my, my beloved and I. Uh, if you want to pray for us, so we appreciate it. And uh, there is a one of these things, I forget what they call them, QR code. Thank you. Uh, you can tell I didn't do it. Somebody did it for me, but that will take you straight to the YouTube channel if you want to listen to messages on various books of the Bible. Well, book of Hebrews, please. I'd like you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to do two readings from Hebrews, one in chapter 12, one in chapter 3. And you'll see that there's a similar theme in both of them, and we're going to try and put them together. And so beginning in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And then please, chapter 3 of the epistle to the Hebrews, and I want to read from verses 12 down to verse 14, Hebrews 3, 12 through 14, it says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Again, God will bless the reading of his precious word to us. I don't know if you've figured it out yet, but I, I want to think about this idea of striving against sin. Uh, we saw it in chapter 12, verse 4, you have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. It's kind of interesting that our society is all about tolerance of sin. And actually, our society tolerates every sin, not even tolerates it, actually boasts about it, is proud of every sin, it seems. And yet, for the child of God, uh, we should be consistently dealing with the issue of sin. Now, we're thankful. When we think of sin, we, we see it in three aspects, don't we? There's sin's penalty, the penalty of sin. And that was paid fully by the Lord Jesus on Calvary's cross. And as true believers, we're not worried about sin's penalty. It's paid. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Thank God for that. I'm not worried about the penalty of sin. It's being paid. But the power of sin is still very real. And I don't care how long you've been a Christian, if you're just saved or if you've been saved 40 years or 50 years, sin is still a power that can affect our daily lives. And so how are you doing in the battle with sin? Like, Do you feel like you're, you're winning or, or are you struggling? Is sin still gripping you? Is it still affecting your life? And so I want to kind of look at that issue of sin today. And I've got a very simple four-point outline. 
And it goes like this, and, and, and it's just, it's pretty easy. It has to be simple and easy for me to get it. So that's why I'm going to keep it that way. First of all, I want to say this, sin is unbelief. In fact, I, I'm absolutely convinced that I've never seen it more clearly in all my Christian life that sin at its very root is unbelief. Sin is unbelief. And then I want to look at this thought that sin is ugly. Now, it looks attractive to us, but I want to think of it, how does God view it? Sin is ugly. And then sin is unnecessary because Christ came to set us free. It's not necessary. It shouldn't be part of our lives anymore. He came to free us from the power of sin, not just the penalty of sin. And uh, again, I, I kind of jumped ahead there. Sin is unnecessary before that one. Sin is unrelenting. So sin is unbelief, sin is ugly, sin is unrelenting, sin is unnecessary. I want to begin with this idea of sin is unbelief. All sin is rooted in unbelief. Starting in the Garden of Eden, when God said to Adam and Eve, the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die, did they believe God or did they believe the serpent? The serpent said, you will not surely die, right? So, so the first sin, I know it was disobedience, but actually it was unbelief. They didn't believe what God said about sin. God said, you eat that, you will die. And they didn't believe it. And, and so I want to suggest to you that all sin comes from this, this unbelief in God. When you and I sin, we, we, what we're saying is, I don't believe you, God. I don't believe how serious sin is. I don't believe what you're saying. We'll talk more about that as we get into the specific details. But notice in Hebrews 12, 1, where, where he talks about, wherefore seeing we're also compassed about with so great crowd of, cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And then notice this, and the sin which does so easily beset us. I want you to notice that he uses the singular, not the plural. He didn't say the sins which do so easily beset us. He said there's one specific sin, singular, that so easily besets us. And I want to suggest to you that when you look at the epistle to the Hebrews, the one sin that is besetting them is the sin of unbelief. Right? That's what's stopping them running the race successfully. That's what's causing them to, instead of make progress in the Christian life, to just kind of go around in circles and really get nowhere. That's that's It's the sin of unbelief. Uh, let me prove that to you. Go back to chapter three again. I want you just to see something here, that really the, the heart issue in the epistle to the Hebrews was the sin of unbelief. Chapter three, again, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. If, the, if we ever turn our way from away from God, if we ever depart from God in any way, it's based on an evil heart of unbelief. We're just not believing what God is saying. Look at verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Notice chapter 4, verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Uh, verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And what he's doing is using the picture of the nation of Israel. And remember how God had done amazing things for them. He, he had delivered them from Egypt with great power, right? I mean, they'd, they'd crossed the Red Sea uh, on dry ground. I mean, you talk about seeing God do amazing works. And then uh, how in, in, in the wilderness, how they had, uh, they'd seen him provide for them. They, their shoes didn't wear out. He provided manna for them in the wilderness. He brought water out of the rock. He just provided so abundantly. And yet when they got to the, the border, to Kadesh Barnea of the promised land, why did they not enter in? What's the reason? <laughs> Unbelief. And so instead, they spent 40 years 
going around in circles like NASCAR extended, you know, kind of going around in circles for 40 years. And in that 40 years, as they're going around in circles, you know what they did? They attended funerals of people who didn't believe God. A whole generation died. That's, yes, Joshua and Caleb, what did you do the last 40 years? We attended a lot of funerals of people who didn't believe God. And they failed to enter in. Now he's talking about the race here in chapter 12. And he's saying to us, uh, how are we doing in the race? Are we, are we making progress or, or are we being hindered? And of course, it's not a sprint. By the way, the Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a long race. <laughs> Some of us have been running it a long time. It's a long race. But, but are we going to cross the finish line strong? And what would it be that would hold us up? And he talks about the fact that, well, there's weights that, that hold us up. And then he says that there's the sin which does so easily beset us. That besetting sin of unbelief can prevent us from really crossing that finish line well. And so I want to just think of it in the context of this epistle of the idea of running the race well. Notice he says in verse 1 of chapter 12, wherefore, uh, whenever you see that wherefore, you ask why is the wherefore, therefore, it's because of what's gone before in chapter 11. Well, what's chapter 11 about? It's about faith, isn't it? It's the faith chapter. Here's a whole generation that did believe God, that that saw amazing things accomplished, that 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 witnessed God working in a tremendous way. And it says these these uh, these great cloud, in other words, there's a lot of them, this great company, they, uh, it says, they're cloud of witnesses. And what it's not that they're watching us running the race. What it's telling us is this, their life witnesses to us, testifies to us of the joy of the life of faith. That's the life to live, the life of faith, not the life of unbelief. Life of unbelief is miserable. Like, can anybody name the 10 other spies that went into the land? We all know Joshua and Caleb, but can anybody name even one of the 10? Right? We don't remember the duds that live their lives in unbelief. We remember those that live by faith. Are we living by faith, you see? Are we walking a life of faith? And so they, they testify to us. They're not spectators, as some, as some have imagined, but they are, their very lives speak to us of the blessings of the life of faith in contrast to unbelief. And, and let's just look at one of them because it's pertinent to this issue of sin and our ongoing battle with sin. We're saying that all sin is really rooted in unbelief. And so I want you to notice verse 24 of Hebrews 11. It says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. Now, just think about this. Moses could have had anything he wanted. All right? I mean, he's raised with royalty. All the riches of the and all the sins of Egypt were available to him. And yet he left it all behind. Why? He actually believed his mama. Isn't that interesting? You remember that his mom took him and she nurtured him in those years for, for Pharaoh's daughter. And somehow as she was nurturing him and nursing, she whispered into his ears the things of God. And he believed the things of God. And he believed in the recompense of reward that there were greater riches than Egypt could ever offer in believing the word of God. And he, what a, what a testament to us. And of course, it tells us there about sin. It, it, it talks about the pleasures of sin. But then he says, the pleasure of sin for a season. It's just good to remind ourselves that sin, we would we, we, be foolish to say it's not pleasurable. If it wasn't pleasurable, it would have no appeal to any of us. 
there is a pleasure in sin, but it's very temporary. It's only for a season. But eternal riches are forever. And faith embraces the eternal. Unbelief grasps at the temporary. So I'm asking you the question. Are you still struggling with sin? And is the reason you're struggling with sin is that you just don't believe God? Because all sin is rooted in unbelief. <clears throat> so he talks about this race that we're running. We have these witnesses. They testify to us of the life of faith. It's a great cloud. And then he tells us, it's our turn now. They, they have run their race, and they've done it well. They're the great heroes of the Old Testament. The Old Testament says, our turn is now. And he says to us, let us run with patience. The race set before us. But in order to run successfully, there are two things we have to do. We have to lay aside every weight. And then he says, the sin that does so easily beset us. So let's just think about the weights, first of all. The weights are not necessarily sin, but they're, they're holding us back, running the race well. I was uh, speaking at a, a, a Indian Brethren conference recently, and uh, they asked me to speak on this particular portion of scripture in Hebrews 12. And, and it was a Sunday morning, and there's all these sisters in their saris, and it was like a like standing before a sea of saris. I mean, beautiful color and all. But I, I used the illustration. I said, now imagine, sisters, that you're running a race. <laughs> now, you could legitimately run it in your saris <laughs> if you wanted to. But it would make it really difficult, wouldn't it? You, you know what I mean? I mean, it's not exactly the most athletic wear to wear running a race. Nothing wrong with wearing a sock, but not for race. <laughs> it wouldn't work very well. And, and so there are things in our lives that, that are not wrong. They're not necessarily evil, but they're not really helpful for the race. <laughs> they, they slow us down. Uh, they, they hold us back. Uh, we can, you know, people ask, well, what are your hobbies? You ever ask that, get, get asked that question? I get asked that all the time. What are your hobbies? I don't have any hobbies. I, I'm sorry, I don't. It's like... The work of God and, and my wife and family, that's all consuming. There's nothing left but that. That's it, <laughs> right? Like, and why would you want that kind of stuff? It's filling your life with empty things instead of believing God for the eternal things. And, and so what, what are these weights that we're carrying along with us that are just stopping us making real progress in, 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 in the, uh, the, the race for the Lord. They're, they're holding us back. We, we devote a lot of our time and energy to them, but they're not really going to help us cross that finish line well. And so he says, you've got to lay aside those things, every weight. And, and we need to ask ourselves, Lord, show me what are the weights in my life that are stopping me running well? What am I wasting my time on that is of no eternal consequence? It's just, it's not evil. It's not like I'm looking at evil things or doing evil, but I'm wasting a lot of time on things that when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ is just going to be a heap of wood, hay, and stubble. No eternal value whatsoever. When evil, just a waste of life. Get aside, lay aside every way. And then this sin which does so easily beset us. The word beset, it, it's found, it's, it's unique. It's only here in the New Testament. And it's a thought of encircling or surrounding, even to the point of clinging to. <laughs> in other words, you're trying to run a race, but you imagine something is clinging to you and it's kind of stopping you going anywhere, right? And, and he says the sin. And of course, it's that sin of, of unbelief that's really holding me back. <laughs> and so... We might ask the question, how are we doing in the race? It, Paul said to the Galatians, you were running well. Who did hinder you? And the language there is, 
somebody cut in. <laughs> you know, have you ever had that happen? You, I remember one time I, I was actually in Mumbai Airport, and I was uh, those days I had uh, I didn't have a backpack, I didn't have sense to have a backpack. I had one of those things you pulled behind you, and it was like pulling a dead dog around with you. I mean, it was all my notes in there and everything, and I'm pulling this, and I'm 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 trying to get the next connection, and a guy with another dead dog carrying behind him, he went cut right in front of me. And I went right on my knees, kind of marble floor, bang. Oh, wow, it was painful to even to think of it. Uh, talk about making your eyes water. It really did. But you see, somebody, I, was, I was running well <laughs> to catch my flight, and somebody cut in. And that's the picture here. You were running. Who did hinder you? And so you might ask, what's hindering me from running well, from finishing strong? He talks about looking unto Jesus. I want you to get the picture that, that the Lord Jesus is on the other side of the finish line, urging you on. He wants you to finish well. He wants to, as it were, you know how somebody crosses the line and there's somebody there after a marathon and they've got a blanket they put around them and they're, they're just there. Well, the, the Lord Jesus is there waiting for you, wanting you to finish well and finish strong. And he's, as it were, got the blanket to wrap around you and welcome you as you finish that race. That's the picture here, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so, Again, if you can just get this thought in your mind, next time you're tempted with sin, ask yourself this, do I really believe God? Because every sin is rooted in unbelief. We don't believe what God says about sin. We don't even believe what price was paid for sin. Right? We can be here thanking the Lord for dying on the cross for us and, and remembering him. And then the very next week, the very sins that nailed him to the cross, we can embrace. And we're saying, Lord, I don't really believe you. That's what we're saying. Sin is unbelief. Sin is ugly. It's deforming. You see, man was made in the image and likeness of God. There's a dignity about man. And yet you see a man laying in the gutter. You, you see him just marred by sin. And you say, how did that happen? This man who was made in God's image and likeness, and, and he has now fallen to such a degree that he, he looks so, uh, so wrecked, ravaged, broken by sin. Sin is really ugly. Uh, it's portrayed in the Old Testament, book of Leviticus, it portrays it as leprosy. It's interesting that leprosy, uh, it, it's when that which was on the inside, the disease, breaks out on the outside and you can see it. See, we all have sin in the, in the heart, but when it breaks out, it's obvious to see. And that's how the picture of leprosy. But look at Isaiah chapter 1. I want you just to see how God describes sin. And it's pretty graphic. Isaiah chapter 1, he's speaking to God's people, by the way, in this description. He says, our sinful nation, this is Isaiah 1 verse 4, our sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger, they have gone away backwards. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. And then listen to this. The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Now, isn't that a graphic description? Like, you just get this picture of saws oozing pus all over from, from the sole of your feet to the top of your head. Is that an ugly description? Like, if you, you know, if you woke up this morning and looked in the mirror and you saw all this, these open saws oozing pus coming out of your face, sisters, be honest. <laughs> uh, would you want to come to the meeting, right? Uh, I don't think you would, right? I mean, it, like it, you wouldn't even want to go to the door to say hello to anybody, right? It would be, but, but God says, that's what sin is like. That's how repulsive sin is to me. 
when I made you in my image and your and my likeness, and you, you have you have embraced in that which is evil, rebellious, wicked, and I want you to see what it really looks like. I don't think we believe what God says about sin. I don't think we believe how hideous it is in his sight. But this is what he's telling us. Now, in contrast, I want you to think about how God sees holiness. I want you to look with me, please, to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And I think it's a, a marvelous, marvelous contrast between the ugliness of sin and the beauty of of holiness. Notice how he describes it here. Second Chronicles 20, verse 21. It says, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to pr say, Praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And I just thought, what a graphic contrast. God says, to us in a very descriptive way in Isaiah chapter one, sin is really ugly. Putrefying is all this, that description. On the other hand, he says, holiness is beautiful because it's like God. You see, we're made in the image and likeness of God. And when we're, when we're walking in holiness, we resemble the character of our creator. And, and that is beautiful. He is beautiful. He's altogether lovely. And the more Christ-like we are, the more beautiful our lives are. So sin is ugly. But Satan, remember that he's the liar, and he's been that from the very beginning. And he's a deceiver. And part of, and he talks about, in, in Hebrews 3, about uh, beware uh, about the the deceitfulness of sin. It always tries to put a positive spin on it, right? It, it it's always tries to make it look good, but it's ugly. It's, it's, it's awful. It really is. We, we've got to see it the way God sees it, and we can't allow the lies of the deceiver to trick us. And then sin is unrelenting. I've learned some lessons over the years. One is that my flesh does not improve with age. <laughs> Paul says this, Romans 7, 18, for I know that in my flesh dwelleth a little bit of good, no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And so what we find is that no matter how long we've been a Christian, that flesh still is there. <laughs> it hasn't been eradicated. It, I wish that doctrine was true, by the way. I wish the eradication of the flesh was really true. I, I'd be preaching it all the time. But it isn't. It's still there. And it's still, well, there's no good thing in it. I remember as a young believer asking an older saint if it got any easier. I was really hoping that he'd have some encouragement for me. <laughs> the scoundrel had no encouragement whatsoever. He said, it seems to get harder. And I, I, what a discouragement. That's why, by the way, I long for the rapture. Amen. Not because I want to escape the tribulation period. That's, that's the least of my worries. What I'm concerned about is this to be able to love the Lord with an unsinning heart. That's a very appealing thing for me. Temptation comes often. We're told to flee youthful lusts. What I found is that I'm not a youth anymore. In fact, it's a long time ago that I was a youth. But what I found is that youthful lusts don't flee from me. They're still there. Isn't that amazing? And so I still have to flee youthful lusts, even though I'm in my 60s early, but still in my 60s. I still have to flee from it. The Lord says, when he taught his disciples how to pray, he said, part of how you should pray is lead me not into temptation, but deliver us 
from evil. <laughs> Boy, did you pray that this morning? Life's full of it, isn't it? They're very real. And so uh, sin is unrelenting. I keep thinking, you know, the, there's just a step between me and falling. Uh, just not too long ago, I I, I fell physically. I, I was <laughs> early in the morning. I was getting ready to go on a prayer time at 6 a.m. And it was dark in the room and and uh, we'd been sorting some boxes out and I'd forgotten that I'd put boxes there and I was uh, carrying my coffee pot and I had my laptop and, and I, I fell and I actually fell onto a, an old CD case, one of the glass, you know, kind of not glass, but plastic ones. And it got embedded in my leg. I ended up in the emergency room, all the rest of it. And, and I just thought, isn't it how easy it is to fall physically, especially you get older. It's very easy. Just one slip. And you're, and you're down, and the consequences to that. And yet, how easy it is to fall spiritually. No matter how long you've been saved, better men than me, much better men than me, are no longer in ministry. They fell. Take heed, he that thinks he stands, lest he also fall. How we should pray, Lord, hold up my feet that I slip not. Well, it could be me. And so there's a sense of this unrelenting nature of sin uh, attacking us. Uh, the temptation is real. And then fourthly, sin is un unnecessary. It's unnecessary because the Lord came to set us free. And again, it comes down to this idea of do we really believe him? Faith versus unbelief. Look at John 8 for a minute. John 8, it says this. <clears throat> but read from verse 31. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, from what? What is he saying truth can set us free from? Is he just thinking of the penalty of sin? Is that what's in his mind? Well, notice it says in verse 33, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and we never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free. By the way, I find that the most ironic verse in the entire word of God. You talk about selective memory. <laughs> we're Abraham's seed. We're never in bondage. To any what happened in Egypt? Were they just on vacation down there? <laughs> They were slaves in Egypt, weren't they? They were in bondage in Egypt. And then what about the captivity? How did they end up going down to Babylon or to Assyria? Was that another vacation? No, they were slaves, weren't they? And what about now? Like when the Lord is writing, Rome, right? They've been in bondage continually. Isn't it amazing how blind, you know, this really came home to me recently, how easily... I can see faults in others and how blind I am to my own faults. You find that? I find I, I, I can see through people just like this. I mean, I look at them, I, I, I can see it, but I can't see myself. That's the hardest thing, isn't it? Lord, sh this is a painful prayer. Lord, show me my faults. Show me my sin. Reveal it to me that I might repent of it and forsake of it, forsake it. And so he says in verse, in the Lord answers, uh, Jesus answered verse 34, Verily, verily, I say to you, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And so what he's saying is the, the commission of sin, the, the actual act of sin is, is showing we're slaves. We're not free. We're still in slavery to the flesh. We're still in slavery to to the demands of the old, and we and that's what it that's what it's that's why sin is so ugly. It makes slaves out of all of us. You know, people talk about slavery and reparation. We're all slaves to the tyrant of sin. And yet, what does the Lord say? So you don't have to live as a slave. He says. In verse 35, verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And so 
what he's telling us is that you can experience victory in Christ. Not in your own strength, right? Because you can't fight flesh with flesh. In my flesh is no, you can't do it. It's not possible. But there is a strategy to victory. Christ is the one who can set us free. Just as he set us free from the penalty of sin, he's telling us, I also can free you from the power of sin, just as I ultimately will free you from the very presence of sin. When he calls us up in the rapture, we'll be free from the very presence of sin. That's why it looks it's so appealing, isn't it? But he can free me today from the power of sin. How do we know that? Again, let's look at Romans 7. I find these verses very encouraging. And um, Romans 7, 24. And because it raises an interesting question, um, Romans 7, 24. We're talking about a lot this morning about sanctification, dealing with sin. Notice he says, uh, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, I, I believe this is the Apostle Paul as a believer, a saved man. And, and he's a man who has gone through this experience. He figured, now I'm saved. I, I should be able to fulfill the law, but I, I, I still find that there's a law in me that the good that I would do, I, I don't do, and the, the evil I don't want to do, I end up doing it. And he's still conflicted with this battle within, the raging within him, and, and he gets to the point of a crisis. And by the way, sometimes people say, well, is salvation you know, or, or sanctification, is it crisis sanctification or, 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 or is it continuous? And I say, yes. <laughs> because in a sense we'll never ever get deliverance unless we come to a crisis where we're sick of living like this Th there's a sense in which we have to get to romans seven twenty four before we can really experience the joy of romans 8 and so we've got to get to this place where you're so sick of failure, so sick of confessing your sin. Lord, it's me again. Lord, it's the same sin again. Remember that? If you confess your sin, it's faithful and just to forget. It's, Lord, it's, have you ever done that? Maybe I'm the only one. Lord, it's me again. <laughs> it's the same sin again. So what he says is, oh, wretched man that I am. And then he says this. He doesn't say, Lord, what, what program will deliver me from the body of this flesh. Is there a 12-step program I can sign up for? No, no, he's not looking to a program. What bestseller can set me free? No, he says, who? Who shall deliver me? It was he's looking to somebody outside of himself, a real person who can deliver him from the body of this death. I mean, the idea is this, that this body is, is always, it's, it's supposed to be alive, but it's always leading to that which is connected with death, sin. Uh, and so he says, um, who's going to deliver me? And of course, I, I love the next verse. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, because Christ is always the deliverer, always. And then he goes on, and I love this. He, he says in verse 2, and I want you to, of chapter 8, he says, The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, don't you just love that? To me, what he's saying, and, and this gives me so much encouragement, what it tells me is this. There's a man that got free. Right? Isn't that what he says? I thank God, uh, he says, sorry, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin. So if he got free, you can get free. I can get free. This law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And what does that mean? And it was there's this law of sin and death that's dragging me down all the time. It's, it, it, it's like gravity. It's always pulling me down. But there's another law working within me the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And so as I depend on the Lord Jesus, now I'm going to tell you now, just to kind of put it quickly, I, I, want, I want to give you the strategy for victory. And it's, it's simple. Take vitamin D3. I'm serious. D3. This will help you remember, D3. <laughs> the Christian life, and of course during the pandemic, 
um, doctors, uh, sound doctors who were not slaves to Big Pharma, <laughs> they would advise taking high doses of vitamin D3 and zinc. That's what they tell you. And it's been proven to be true. Very helpful. So I'm going to give you the vitamin D3. The Christian life... There are three dimensions to the Christian life. You need all three. Christian life is a dependent life. Can't be done in our own strength. Every single day. I, I say to people, I, I joke about this, but uh, not because I'm English, but no Christian should celebrate Independence Day ever. Because for a believer, every day is Dependence Day. Lord, before you put your feet on the floor in the morning, you know what you need to say? Lord, I can't live this Christian life. Unless you live it through me, there's no hope for me today. I'm going to blow it. It's a dependent life. Every aspect of the Christian life is a dependent. I depend on him for my eternal destiny. I depend on him for my next breath. I depend on him to walk in a way pleasing to him. It's a dependent life. Secondly, it's a devotional life. It, it's a love relationship with a living person. And, and as I sin comes along, I've got to think, what is this going to do to my beloved? Well, actually, it caused him to suffer on Calvary. That's what it did, right? I'm in love with someone. If I'm in love with somebody, I don't want to hurt them. It's a devotional life, a love relationship. With them. And then it's a disciplined life. There's a discipline. Exercise yourself towards godliness. Discipline yourself towards godliness. And so I want to go to chapter 3, and I, I think my time is just about running out here, but I want you to go to Hebrews 3, and I want to finish with this uh, kind of little exhortation in this battle against sin. And that is this, that we, we can't do it on our own in terms of we need, first of all, the Lord. We're dependent on him. But there's a certain sense in which we need each other. Notice again, Hebrews 3, 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But then he says this, but exhort one another every Sunday morning while it's called the Lord's day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Is that what it says? It's not just on a Sunday, is it? Exhort one another daily while it's called today. <laughs> Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You know, there's no harm. We've got the technology today to do this. To text one another and ask the question, How's it doing? How's it going today, brother? You running the race well? You struggling with sin? Can I pray for you? You see, it's interesting, isn't it? Sin has a hardening effect. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And, and sin is very deceitful. I mean, it's so deceitful. Uh, it's deceitful in, in so many ways, like this. It's a, well, I know others got caught but I'm not going to get caught. That's really deceitful, isn't it? You're kind of thinking that consistently the way of the transgressor is hard, but somehow thinking that you're going to have a happy ending. <laughs> it's deceitful. And so what we need is daily exaltation from one another. How's it going, brother? How's it going, sister? Are you, are you living a life of victory today? Are you walking by faith today? The early Christians, why was the early church so dynamic? Uh, just look at Acts chapter 2. It wasn't just a Sunday morning only kind of deal with them. They, they had not learned that it's just Sunday morning only Christianity. It had never dawned on them. In fact, uh, in sec, uh, Acts 2.46, they continue in daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. There was a daily dimension to the Christian life of the saints. They were involved in each other's lives. 
it's difficult in a city, but it's easy in a city too, because of technology. There's no reason why we can't be involved in each other's lives. And we need it because sin is so deceptive. You know, it's increasingly true that people don't see the importance of church life anymore. A survey found that 78% of the general public and 70% of church-going people believe you can be a good Christian without attending church. <clears throat> Scripture would tell you a different story. Actually, when people backslide, usually the first step is they isolate themselves from the saints. Brethren, we need each other. This battle is real, it's unrelenting, it's intense, and it's going to get worse as you see the day approaching. <laughs> and so we need each other to hold each other accountable, to challenge one another, to ask the hard questions of one another and to exalt one another. Brethren, we're running the race. I, I really long personally to finish that race well, to cross the line strong, but I want you to cross it with me strong. <laughs> I want every one of you to, to run well. I don't want to hear that you've fallen that you're another one of these ones that have, well, dishonored the Savior. And I don't want to be one of those either. Brethren, this is so serious. <laughs> this is really serious stuff. But if you can just help remember this simple outline, and particularly the first point, all sin is rooted in unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help my own belief. Help me to really believe you and what you say about these things. Let's pray. Father, we just, we, we're in a battle. We recognize it, but we're thankful for the promises of God. Thanks be to God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, as this week looms before us for a, for a week of daily victories over sin, that sin that does so easily beset us. Lord, we want to run well. Pray for every Christian here, uh, Lord, that they'd run well, that sin would not somehow strangle their usefulness for you. Lord, deliver us from going around in circles and dying in the desert. Help us to enter into all that you intended for us and not miss out on one blessing. We'll give thee the praise and give thee the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.